Hello, my name is Megan, and today I'm going to read the Bible for us. But first of all, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you see us suffering and you understand it. You are the God who loves his people, who sends us jars of clay to do your glorious work. Help us to trust you, God of the generations, Jehovah, the great I am, as the one true God. In your name, Amen. We're going to read from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire and it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight where the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the, fa the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at the Lord. The Lord said, I have seen, indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What then shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Do you remember back when we were worried about bushfires? And we'd ask, where is God in these fires? Or how can God let these fires happen? And that's certainly what the kids in my RI classes at West End State School are asking, and my kids too. And it can feel hard to answer questions like that in a way that doesn't just launch bigger questions, questions like, who made God? Or who is God? Or how do you know? Or why doesn't God do this? And now the bushfires are back in the distant memory, and we have this virus, and you're probably still figuring out how you'd answer these questions, only they're just being asked in the face of a different disaster. A different disaster, but the same fears, the fear of death and destruction. And the question is, God really there in this? Does he care? And what happens if I die? Part of the answer to all these questions relies on properly understanding who God is. And as we set out on this journey to see how Jesus claims to be God in his I am statements and how that answers not just our questions about God, but the feelings that produce our worries and our fears, it's helpful to remind ourselves again who God is. Our God is the I am in whom we live and breathe and have our being. Uh, and that's what's happening in the story that Megan just read for us. The story is that Israel has its own crisis, its own moment where they're asking, who is God? Is God there? Does God care? They're enslaved in Egypt. They're crying out for God to save them. They're terrified, facing death, feeling alone in the vast universe, but oppressed by a powerful and deadly force. 
And we know from our bushfires, from our fire pits and just from science that when fire happens, it burns and it destroys. But in this story, Moses, this Israelite who grew up in an Egyptian palace, comes across a fire with a difference. Moses is on the mountain of God where he meets the God who is. But God appearing in this burning bush, a fire that's burning but not consuming. And Moses sees this and he's curious because he knows how fire works. So he approaches the bush and he hears a voice calling from within the tree. And Moses responds to this voice calling him, here I am. And then with the question, who are you? Who's, who's speaking to me here? And God speaks and he says, I am the God of your father, Abraham. I'm the God of your people, Israel. And, and so here we learn that God is not distant. Uh, though we'll learn from what he says to Moses that God is infinitely big, that the universe exists in him. First, we learn that he's a relational God. He's the God of people, the God in relationship with people, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the creator of the universe, yes, but also the God of Israel. And when Moses meets this God face to face, when he realizes who it is that's speaking to him gloriously from this burning bush, his reaction is one of awe and fear. And yet we see that God is also loving this God of Israel. He says in verse 7 of that passage that means just read Exodus, he says, I've heard them crying out. I'm concerned about their suffering. He's not distant. distant. And in fact, in verse 8, he says, I've come down to rescue them. He's come down. He's bridged the gap from the heavens to the earth. He's entering the physical world as this word speaking from a bush to announce salvation, to announce a rescue for his people. Before we learn who God is in this eternal, infinite, big sense, we learn that he's a relational, loving, faithful, concerned rescuing God who enters the picture to save. He's not an oppressor like the Egyptians and their gods. He stands opposed to oppression. But the catch for Moses is that God has entered the world to save, to speak to him, but he's speaking to send him, to send him, Moses, to Pharaoh to enact this salvation. It's a bit like Moses is being sent into the fires in a bushfire, like a firefighter or the hospitals in a pandemic, like a medical professional. And Moses isn't so sure about this. He was, he was sure about who he was a moment ago where he said, here I am. But now his question is, who am I? Who am I that you would send me? And God says, it's not about who you are, Moses, but about who I am. In verse 12 there, he says, I will be with you. And that his people, Israel, will know that it's God doing the work, not Moses, so that when he brings them out of the land, they'll worship him on that same mountain they're on now. And Moses says, okay, if I go, this bloke who's grown up in Pharaoh's household, the Israelites aren't even going to listen to me. Who do I tell them sent me? They want me to prove it. Who do I say sent me? How do I know who you are? And Moses is a bit like those kids in my RI classes here. Who is God really? Is he really there? And God, at this point, reveals something about who he is, his divine nature, his character, the nature of God, that he is, that he is the I am, the one who is. It's a strange answer, but there's a whole lot caught up in this claim, a whole universe, all of existence. It's this infinite, eternal claim. And the way to understand this when God says, I am, is caught up with the idea that this is the word to be. God is claiming that he is ultimately the one who is, the one who exists upon who all other existence depends. God is the, the foundation of all being. I am. So the thing about those questions, who made God and some similar ones like, what is God or where is God? Where is God in this disaster? Is that they come from this persistent idea we have that God is just a being like us. A big guy with a beard somewhere in the universe, not the being. Do you get that? It's subtle. God is not a being. He's not a much bigger, more powerful person sitting in the sky somewhere with a beard, hurling lightning bolts around that we can find with science, or with our eyes, our senses. We should be able to see him as though we should be able to see him by searching out the universe, or that he should give us some evidence that he's here with us. God is the being, the one who gives all other beings their beings. The one who is. See, this claim God makes answers those questions that we have but it shows how silly it is to look for God the way we want to look for him. So the claim is not that the universe is the base level of reality in which we all find existence, including God. It's that God is and the universe is because he is. We won't find God in the universe as a slightly bigger being any more than a bacteria inside our body will find us bouncing around inside our body. Existence itself 
is evidence for God. Life is evidence for God. And if we can't see that, it's because we're blind to who God is. It's not because he doesn't give us any evidence. So the story of the Bible, it has God creating the heavens and the earth in the beginning, bringing them into being. And this is that same word as the I am. He makes things be. The one who is, is the one who said, let there be, using this same word. And there was, God is the foundation of existence. And that's what he's saying to Moses here as he reveals himself to him, as he sends him into Egypt. So we might think we're the first to ask these clever questions in a crisis. Who is God? Where is God? Why isn't he kind of here next to me while this thing's happening? The first to look for God as though he's a being within the universe, but we're not. It's an ancient mistake to make. The Apostle Paul, when he goes to a city of philosophers, they're doing the same thing as the kids in my RI class who want to find God. In this ancient city of Athens, in Acts 17, the people of Athens thought of gods like beings who could be represented by statues who'd live in temples. And their stories were all these stories of gods acting like powerful but flawed super people. And Paul says that's not who God is. And he's drawing on this idea of the God who reveals himself to Moses. He picks up on the creation story to tell people who are looking for God in temples and statues, they won't find him there because the one who is, the one who made everything, the Lord of heaven and earth, gives everyone life and breath and everything and is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. So the clever questions we want to ask about God as reasons not to believe in moments like this in everyday life, they usually reveal a type of God we shouldn't want to believe in anyway. Not the God who is, not the God who's the base of existence, the one who gives us being, but some other being who we have to decide whether is worth it or not. See, so this is who God is claiming he is. He is the I am. Uh, this is a claim that we should know that God exists because existence exists. But it's one thing to know that there's a God who's the grounds of being, the basis of reality. Uh, that's actually quite an abstract and distant concept of God. It's a God who's out there beyond us, totally infinite, beyond our finite capacity. But the God of the Bible, the God who made the heavens and the earth, wants to be known, which is why he front ends his dealings with Moses, comes down to meet him via his words, speaking through a burning bush, tells him that he's a God who relates to people, who wants to save them because he loves them and hears them. He's not distant. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He is infinite and awe-inspiring. Yes, he's totally beyond our comprehension. Yes, and yet he is relational and loving and faithful and concerned. This God who enters the world to save, who speaks a word to create and then speaks words to reveal himself to Moses through this burning bush. And he wants to be known by name. I am who I am, he says. And then I am is his name. Yahweh. He says, this is the name that Israel is to have and to hold, to know him by. Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Yahweh, which just means I am, has sent Moses to save his people from slavery. And he gives his people his name. It's theirs to call on and to represent in the world. God is awe-inspiring and terrifying in his vastness and in his infinite nature. And yet he draws near to comfort and rescue his beloved children. They can even call him there by his name. They can know him. And in Jesus, this God enters the world. Jesus is, I am, that infinite, vast God in the flesh. Just as God came down to rescue his people, Israel, in the Exodus, speaking by his word to Moses through a burning bush to bring them up into a promised land of life, abundant life, so he came down in Jesus to rescue all people, the whole of creation, speaking by his word, to bring us up into the promise of abundant life in a new creation. So you want evidence for the existence of the God who is, look at the universe that is, but if you want evidence for who God is, look at how he reveals himself in Jesus. All the I am statements in John's gospel that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks are built on John's claim right at the start of his gospel that Jesus is God's word and that the word is God and that in Jesus, God in the flesh is dwelling with us. God's word is made flesh. Uh, John gives us a picture here of the relationships within the triune God, the word who is with God and was God, sent by the Father who is God as the only son who is God. And John's going to unpack this through his gospel as Jesus identifies himself with the Father as God by taking on his name in these I am statements. In Jesus, we see the God who is. 
when we meet Jesus, we are meeting the God of the Psalms, the God of the burning bush, the God of Israel, the God who made heavens and earth. God's word and glory are being presented to us in the flesh. He is the I am. And when Jesus, the word comes down and he takes on flesh, we see his glory. The way Moses saw God and turned away in fear because of God's glory. But Jesus invites us to bring our fear to him. Jesus is that same loving relational God we meet in the Old Testament who saves his people. Now there are some features, uh, there are some famous I am statements in John that often get packaged up as one lot. But before we hit those, they're the ones we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. There are two others that will help us as we tackle this series. Two others that lay the groundwork for us. In the first one, Jesus specifically connects himself and his claims to Exodus, to God revealing himself as the God of Abraham, of Israel, as the God who is. Uh, he's going toe to toe with the Pharisees who are claiming to be opposing him because they're Abraham's descendants. And he says, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, at this point, he is claiming something and the Pharisees recognize that they know he is claiming to be God and they try to kill him for it right there and then. For a person to claim to be God was blasphemy. And Jesus claims that if they were Abraham's children, truly, if they were real, the real deal, they would recognize him and through him become God's children. Instead, they're showing themselves as children of Satan. Jesus positions himself as the God who is. He takes the name of God and he applies it to himself. And we can read his other I am statements in John making the same claim. And the Pharisees know exactly what he's doing. But then there's this other I am statement that's not always included in the list of I am statements. It comes in the middle of a storm. The disciples are on a boat. It's in John chapter 6. They're on a boat. The wind is howling. They've left the shore without Jesus. Uh, John just casually drops that Jesus hasn't joined them yet. They're about six kilometers offshore. They've rowed out through the storm. It's dark. It's rough. They're probably starting to wonder if they've bitten off more than they can chew. And if it's anything like that other storm where they're in the boat and Jesus is asleep and they're terrified, they're terrified here too. Some of these guys, they're seasoned fishermen, but even seasoned fishermen know to fear the waters. And they look up across the waters in the storm and they see this terrifying figure approaching them on the water, this glorious figure even walking on the water. And they, like Moses, when they come face to face with God, they're terrified. And what Jesus says to them, and where our NIV translation has Jesus saying, it is I, the Greek here is the same as all the other I am's. He says, I am. Don't be afraid. It's me. It's God. It's God in the flesh. See, when we meet the God who holds creation in his hands, in the flesh, the God who spoke the ground into being from beneath the waters, walking on the water, when God enters the world so that we see his glory face to face, God the Son, the word in the flesh, he says, I am, don't be afraid. The God who is a comfort in our fears, a shelter in the storm, and our rescuer comes down to rescue us. Jesus is the I am. We see that in his life, we see that in his I am statements, but more than that, we see his character. And so the character of God in display in Jesus, in Jesus crucified. So when God spoke through that burning tree that wasn't consumed, send Moses with his word to Pharaoh to rescue his people from the jaws of slavery. Now he sends Jesus, his word into the world to die on a tree, to consume all our sin, all our fears, even death itself. This is the God who is the God who comes down to save. This is how he saves. And when we see Jesus on the cross uh, as this act of historical imagination, when we picture him on the cross dying for us, we see evidence for God. These are God's hands being pierced, his head crowned with thorns. This is the God who is in the flesh. The answer to our questions about what God is like, where he is in the chaos and brokenness of this world. See, when my RI kids or when my own kids want to know about God, they want answers to these abstract questions about the idea of God. Or at least those are the questions they're asking. And abstract answers don't really satisfy us at all in a crisis, in a disaster, because they leave God abstract and unknowable and out there. But in Jesus, we see and know the God who is the I am, stepping down into the brokenness of the world, into death to conquer our fears, to conquer death and to bring us home. So now whatever disaster we face, whether it's deadly fires, the storms of life or real storms, those moments when we feel alone and fearful of what's out there, even deadly viruses that feels like it will always just be around the corner now. 
And if it doesn't get us, it might get people we love either here in Australia or around the world. When we see those things and we fear them, or, or even when we're enslaved and we know it by an economy that's in free fall and, and debt and we don't know what the future looks like, when we're enslaved by fear or by sin and death and the fear of death in particular. We have a God who is both eternal and powerful, the God who gives life and creates the God who is and a God who is not distant. The God who enters the storm, who steps into the world, who takes on flesh and sickness and weakness and poverty and ultimately death, whose words to us are the same as the words to his disciples on the boat, I am. Don't be afraid. And the catch is that this God who speaks and saves and reveals himself, the way he sent Moses into, into Pharaoh, into the lion's den, uh, as his agent of rescue, uh, this same God sends his people into this broken world as his agents of rescue. His disciples who are afraid on the boat, who are terrified at the crucifixion, who are overjoyed at his resurrection and become his living people, who are given his spirit. Jesus sends them into the world as the Father sent him in the flesh. Representatives of the character of God as agents of his rescue and love. And those of us who put our trust in God and have his spirit alive in us, not a spirit of fear, but of hope, are sent in the same way sent into the world like firefighters, like health professionals, but a world broken by sin and curse and death and the fear of death as people claimed by the one who is the I am. That's our calling for those of us who follow Jesus right now. Will you join me as I pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God who is. We thank you that you are the God who is infinite, the God who is the basis of existence, the God in whom we live and breathe and have our being, the God who gives life to all living creatures. But we thank you that you're not just some abstract concept that's out there, but you are a God who is relational and loving and faithful and a God who saves, a God who steps into the mess that we humans made of the world, who steps into the world of sin and curse and death, disease and fire and suffering, to save the one who doesn't oppress with power but uses your power to raise up and we pray that we might put our trust in you as god that we might see you as you reveal yourself in jesus the i am made flesh that we might trust you and so not be afraid that we might see your love for us your character on display at the cross and that we might put our faith and trust in you and so be made new be brought into your people and into the promise of being raised up into a, a new creation, a new promised land where we will be your people. Freed from the fear of death, freed from disease, freed from oppression in this new world that you will make. Lord, we pray that as you give us your spirit now, as you recreate us now, that we might be your sent people in the world. That when we say, here I am, Lord, we know who we are because we know who you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.